the baker and the cupbearer. This is part one of more than one. We're, we're going to go back to Egypt and to the prison where we left Joseph uh, before Advent season. Joseph is living the dream. This, this series, we're going through the story and character of Joseph. We're calling it Living the Dream. Joseph is, quote, unquote, living the dream, but not in the best life now kind of way. It's not the life that he always dreamed of living. But he's on the way through hell and high water to fulfill the dreams he had as a teenager. He's been through a lot of troubles and trials and tests and temptations. The last thing we were looking at before we paused for Advent, our Advent miniseries on Jesus being the hope of the world, was Joseph resisting temptation. Joseph resisting temptation. In fact, we are in the part of Joseph's story where it seems like he basically he's basically getting punished for doing the right thing. I mean, when you read the story, it feels like, what, what's going on? He's doing what's right. He's doing the right thing. He, he's obeying God. He's being faithful in the midst of his circumstances, but he's being punished. What's going on here? Uh, yes, he's living the dream, but this doesn't mean that his life is wonderful. It's not all rainbows and roses. He's living the dream that he had when he was young, but his life seems like a real out-of-control mess. You might even say that Joseph uh, was living the dream right from the start. He, he was daddy's favorite. He was also miraculously given dreams about his distant and certain future in some position of authority and power. But he had to go through a lot of pain before he reached that position of power. That painful period is where we are in the story. He's, he's not in a good place right now. His own backstabbing brothers hated him. They conspired together against him. They sold him into the slave trade to foreigners after first almost killing him. In chapter 39 of Genesis, we read about his time as a slave to Potiphar in Egypt. And in spite of his slavery, he became very successful. He was a successful slave. So we spent quite a bit of time looking at the seven habits of highly successful slaves. And something happened to him as a highly successful slave that got him thrown into prison. He went from being a slave to a prisoner. But even as a prisoner, those same seven habits made him highly successful again. And we read about that at the end of chapter 39 of Genesis. But in the middle of Genesis 39, we looked at what happened after his success as a slave that got him thrown into prison. Something happened when he was a slave to Potiphar that got him thrown into prison. Prison. Maybe there was a prism in there, I don't know. And basically what happened was that he resisted temptation. In prison, he resisted, or as a slave, he resisted temptation. And resisting temptation didn't seem to be rewarded. It actually got him thrown into jail, to prison. He was Potiphar's slave, sold into slavery by his, his own family. He was highly successful as a slave. And then uh, he was so successful, he was so successful, even as a slave, and also, he was so, quote-unquote, handsome in form and appearance, as it says in verse 6 of Genesis 39. He was so successful and handsome that his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, was extremely attracted to him. Genesis 39, 7 through 10 says this, And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph, day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. So Joseph, he had every excuse in the book to justify giving in to temptation. I mean, really, he had 
every reason. I mean, where's God in all this? He knew one of the one of the seven habits that we looked at was that God was with him. It says over and over in the text in Genesis 39, Yahweh was with him. So, but he could have he could have forgotten that easily because he was in such a horrible situation. He was a real victim, and he had all kinds of reasons to feel entitled to succumb to the temptation that he was facing. Yet, he resisted. He refused to give in. He, he, he rejected the sexual pleasure he was being offered. But he was punished for doing the right thing. He, he was punished. He was thrown into prison for resisting temptation. His reward for faithfulness was more suffering. But there's nothing new under the sun, and bad things seem to always happen to good people. But again, we must we have to remember here that the story of Joseph is pointing us to the person and work of Jesus. This is why it's so important. I mean, you, we might just read the story and say, well, what's the point? We resist and we there's no reward. The reward is punishment. The reward is prison. The reward is suffering, trials. But we have to remember this isn't the story about us. This is the story of Jesus. This is the story pointing us to Jesus, to the person and work of Jesus. And if ever there was a picture of bad things happening to good people, it's with Jesus. The story of Joseph is not about just some random character in the Old Testament called Joseph. It's really and ultimately about Jesus himself. And this is something we need to remind ourselves about on a regular basis. Our lives and our, our own situations are never really about us. It's all about Jesus, and he's doing, and what he's doing to make all things right again. God doesn't keep bad things from happening to good people. He doesn't keep bad things from happening to us, but he does, in his grace, promise us that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And this is what the story of Joseph is all about. So Joseph is Potiphar's slave, and Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. She makes advances on him over and over again, but he doesn't take the bait. He doesn't bite. He resists the temptation. He, he fights the flesh, and he wins. And even when winning meant losing, he, he loses his position of power and influence and success and gets locked into prison. Once again, we see in his story a picture of the death, burial, resurrection, and glorification. We see Jesus in Joseph. He was the shadow of Jesus, a type of Jesus, an arrow, an arrow in the Old Testament pointing forward to the New Testament incarnation of Jesus Christ himself. So notice again what it said in verse 7. It says, And after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. It says she cast her eyes on Joseph. And this is where it begins. Uh, this is where sexual immorality starts, by looking, casting your eyes. She cast her eyes on Joseph, and suddenly she's telling him to lie with her. And they, as they say nowadays, well, that escalated quickly. She's just looking at him and says, lie with me. Well, Genesis verse 39, verse 7 through 10 says this. And after... A time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. Joseph says, He's put me in charge of everything. How can I do this? My, my master, Potiphar, trusts me. He trusts me. He, 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 everything in this house of his is in my charge. He's not even greater than me. We're equal. He's telling Potiphar's wife this. He's saying, how could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it didn't stop. She kept pursuing, and he kept refusing. She did all the wrong things, and he did all the right things, but he ended up in prison. And this is where we have to remember that all things work together for good. Not all things are good that happen. 
Joseph resisted, but even though he did the right thing, things got worse for him. And then one day, one day this kept happening, uh, and then one of the one day no one was home. It was just Joseph. No other, none of the other guys were home, and she tried again. It says in verse eleven of Genesis thirty-nine. But one day when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were in the house, were there in the house. She caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, fled, and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he's brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out. He left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew, the Hebrew servant whom you've brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. That's what we now call fake news. If, if she was telling her story on Twitter, she would have attached a hashtag Me Too to it. Not only did she claim to be the victim, when her husband came home, she tried to turn it actually into a racial thing. She, it says, the, the Hebrew servant, that Hebrew servant whom you've brought in among us came in to laugh at me. There's really nothing new under the sun. The perp pretended to be the victim and then tried to turn it into a racial thing. And, and as you know, Joseph paid a price for his loyalty and his integrity, and he got thrown into prison. Now, let me just read the rest of chapter 39 before we get into the, the text for today. Genesis 39, verse 19. And as soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. Now, I, I want to pause there because his, his anger was kindled. Who was he angry at? Who was he? Well, did he uh, we'll get into this later, but did he really believe his wife? That's the question. His anger was kindled. He was angry about what he was hearing from his wife, but did he really believe her? Let's just continue. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But Yahweh was with Joseph. Again, just as when he was a slave to Potiphar, now he's in prison, and still Yahweh was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because Yahweh was with him, and whatever he did, Yahweh made it succeed. Again, as we have seen, he was highly successful, not only as a slave, but now as a prisoner. Yahweh didn't keep him from becoming a slave. Yahweh didn't keep him from becoming a prisoner, but he was with him as a slave. He was with him as a prisoner and gave him Success, quote unquote, success in spite of his circumstances. And this brings us to where we left off in the story. So let's have everybody stand for the reading of our text from God's living, holy, inspired, and infallible word. Genesis 40, starting in verse 1. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night they both dreamed the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream. And each dream 
with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, there was a vine. There was a vine before me. And on the vine, there was three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to, the, to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. Notice he's back in the pit. Verse 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Oh, there's so much in this chapter. It's so good. And we're not even going to get too far into it today. Potiphar's wife, being humiliated and revengeful, got her husband to throw Joseph into prison. This is where we should note the obvious. Why did Potiphar, why did he only throw Joseph into prison? Think about it. This is, this is the guy who tried to rape his wife, as she put it. Supposedly, Joseph, this slave, tried to attack his own wife, and all he did was throw him in prison. Why didn't he torture him? Why didn't he kill him? I think the answer is obvious. Potiphar trusted Joseph. Remember, Potiphar trusted him. He trusted Joseph more than his own wife. But being a gutless wuss that he was, uh, he had to do something with Joseph. He had to do something, so he put him into prison. And as we saw, not only was he highly successful as a slave, he just again became highly successful as a prisoner. His name tag said prisoner, but he was exercising dominion and gaining more and more influence uh, in spite of what his name tag said. Potiphar obviously didn't believe his wife's story, but he had to do something. So he threw, threw Joseph into prison. But here's the twist. Remember what it said back in verse 1. Let's remember what it said back in verse 1 of chapter 39, the previous chapter. It says, now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. This is after his brothers sold him into slavery. This is after he was abandoned and, and sold to his, uh, into slavery by his own flesh and blood. It says, Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, 
an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. An Egyptian had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. This is something that even most commentaries don't point out. I don't know why, but they seem to ignore. But it seems rather ob obvious. Potiphar is called in verse 1 of chapter 39, uh, not just an officer of Pharaoh, but also the captain of the guard. Potiphar is the captain of the guard. Now listen to the first four verses of chapter 40 again. It says, Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. So the chief cupbearer and the chief baker were thrown into the prison where Joseph was incarcerated, where he was confined, and the captain of the guard over that prison was none other than Potiphar, Potiphar himself. As James Jordan points out, Potiphar figured he could still make good use of Joseph in prison by letting him run things there. So instead of putting him to death, Potiphar punished, quote-unquote, punished Joseph by casting him into prison and then put him in charge of everything. That's what's happening there. So Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph of trying to rape her, but instead of killing Joseph, he, the captain of the guard, Potiphar, puts Joseph in the prison that he was in charge of. He was the captain of the guard. He obviously, he obviously trusted Joseph in spite of what his wife was accusing Joseph of doing. He, he saw Joseph's success and what he did in charge of his household, so now he puts him in charge of his prison. Like, yeah, you did a great job in my house, but now because of my wife, I'm going to put you in charge of the prison. So, so now we know the setting of chapter 40, but in verses 1 through 3, we're introduced to these two new characters, these two characters in Joseph's story. It says again, sometime after this, the cupbearer, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt, speaking of Pharaoh, the cupbearer of Pharaoh and his baker, committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. The cupbearer and the baker committed this some kind of offense. They committed some kind of crime against Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. The chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. So the chief cupbearer and the chief baker are thrown by Pharaoh into the prison where Joseph was not, was not only incarcerated and confined, but also put in charge by Potiphar, the captain of the guard. And I think we need to remember, again, the story of Joseph is, is not just a morality tale that we can emulate Joseph, say, be be uh, positive in bad circumstances like Joseph was. You know, that's not, it's not a morality tale. This is a story about Jesus. It's pointing to Jesus. It's a picture and foreshadow of Jesus. We, as I've mentioned in the beginning of this series, we're not the heroes in the story. We're the villains. We're the villains who need the hero. We're not the heroes. We're not Joseph. We're his wicked evil brothers who sold him into slavery, sold him into the slave trade. We're the ones who lied about him to his father. We're the ones that, that left him for dead. We're the ones that let him be sold into slavery to foreign foreigners in a foreign land. And when, when we started this series, I said Joseph's story includes a dysfunctional family, Sibling rivalry, neglect, jealousy, favoritism, greed, betrayal, depression, injustice, the slave trade, sexual harassment, 
temptation, frustration, alienation, the underdog overcoming success through adversity, plot twists, the Lord's Supper, God's providence and provision, death, burial, resurrection, and glorification, and a journey from outcast to overcomer, from forsaken to forgiver, from revenge to redemption. That's what this story is all about. This is a glorious story, but it's a story about Jesus. It's all about him. It's a providential story about about parents, a pit, a potiphar, a prison, and a palace. And it's the story of the whole Bible. The story of Joseph is the story of the the entire Bible. It's the story of glory through suffering, exaltation through humiliation, you know, no sweat, no sanctification, no cross, no crown, no guts, no glory. The the dictionary of biblical imagery says this, the literary pattern of the Joseph story is tightly structured in a series of repetitive sequences. There are three sets of dreams, each of which comes in a series of two. Joseph dreams of his supremacy over his family. The butler and baker dream of their imminent fortunes. Pharaoh dreams of abundance and famine. These dreams are closely associated with Joseph's imprisonments in the pit, into slavery, and in prison. And with his rise from favored outcast son to second in command of Potiphar's house, of the prison, and finally, of all of Egypt. That's the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery. So he goes from the pit to, to, to slavery to prison. And we, and we see this is all pointing us to Jesus. It's all pointing us to him. Remember when the two guys, the two disciples, after Jesus rose from the dead, after the resurrection, they were walking on that road to Emmaus, and Jesus joins them. He, 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 he joins them on the path, and they, they don't recognize him. And they're talking about all the stuff that had happened. They couldn't believe that Jesus was killed. They couldn't believe what had happened. They were confused. They were questioning everything because it seemed like all their hopes, all their dreams had been disappointed and were pointless. And then Jesus walks up to them, and he says, what, what's this conversation? What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? Then they stop, as it says in Luke 24, looking sad, and one of them named Cleopas answered, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? So Jesus says, What's going on? What are you guys talking about? And he says, Are you cra- are you nuts? Do you, do you not know what happened? Have you not heard? And then I just want to read you this, the rest of the story in Luke 24. It says, And he said to them, What things? Jesus said, what things happened? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But he, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They said, that's what we hoped for. We thought he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. In other words, they, they said, now he wasn't the one. But he had, uh, yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. It was three days. Remember the the dreams that the baker and the cupbearer had all happened within three days. There's a clue there, right? Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had, even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. They, the, the, the women came back, said they saw a vision of angels saying he was alive, and they're still, you know, sad. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory and beginning with Moses, which is who wrote Genesis chapter 39 and 40, which is the one who wrote the story of Joseph? Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter to to his glory and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them 
in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He, he calls them foolish ones and slow to heart to believe what Moses wrote about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it seems like they're not too bright. It, it seems like, what, really? They didn't get it? They, they, they said some of the women found the empty tomb. The angels told them he was risen. They went and checked it out for themselves. They found it was empty, and, and they were still sad. They were still confused. But the point is that they should have known what was happening based on what R Moses wrote, based on what Moses wrote about in Genesis, in Genesis and all the Old Testament, the, the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. John 5 45 says, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me. This is Jesus speaking. If you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Moses wrote about Jesus. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? The story of Joseph is the story of Jesus. And, and, and this is all basically introduction because this chapter is so full of, of, of Jesus. It's so full of, of the picture of Jesus, the body and blood of Jesus. So what should we think about when we're told that the chief cupbearer and the chief baker? What should we think about when we're told there's a, somewhere in this story there's a chief cupbearer and the chief Baker, what does the cup bearer have in his cup, right? It's, we see in his own dream, it's wine. It's the grapes squeezed, and he gives the wine to the king. He gives it to Pharaoh. The, the baker is bread. So we see wine and bread. We're going to get more to it next week, but I think it's obvious that this all points to the king's table. It all points to the bread and wine, the body and blood of Jesus. And so we'll get into the deep, weird stuff next week. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand and pray together. Our great father and king, your son was rich and owned everything. Yet for our sakes, he became poor so that through his poverty, we might become rich. Everything in heaven and earth comes from you, Lord. We give you only what is yours. May you be praised forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen.